rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahman rahim. In the previous class, as Brother Shahran mentioned, we discussed uh, Hassan ibn Sabit. Uh, Hassan was an established poet before he embraced Islam. After he came to Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made use of his poetic genius. He advised Hassan to respond to the poets from Quraysh, uh, the hostile forces who used literature to attack Islam and the Prophet. So our Prophet told Hassan to respond on his behalf. And Hassan said, Hajauta Muhammadan Fana Ajabtu Anhu Wangallahi Fida Lika Jazaw. He said, You have slandered Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I am responding on his behalf. Wangallahi Fida Lika Jazaw and my reward for this with, with is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also mentioned that Hassan bin Sabit was given so much importance during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that our Prophet made a special pulpit, member or platform in Masjid al nabawi for Hassan bin Sabit to recite poetry from. And Hassan bin Sabit used to respond on behalf of the Prophet and he also used to encourage Muslims in the battlefield during different battles and <clears throat> from Hassan bin Sabit to Ibn Hazm we have few centuries in between obviously there have been many many literary figures in Islam in Islamic societies in Muslim societies which we may not be able to cover in this course we are highlighting major Islamic writers from different eras and Muslim rulers in history almost uh, uh, without any uh, different any variation almost most Muslim rulers uh, promoted literature they facilitated literature and they uh, they always had a group of writers around them and the same happened in Muslim Spain, the same happened in, uh, in India, when, where Muslim ruled for about 700 years. And also in Spain, Muslim ruled again for more than 700 years. In India, uh, before Islam came, literature was stifled because uh, language, uh, literature in uh, Sanskrit was exclusive for a group of people, but literature in other languages languages were not was not promoted. But when Muslim came, they promoted literature in all languages in South Asia. In Muslim Spain, we have hundreds and perhaps thousands of writers in all those seven, eight hundred years. And we do not have record of many of them and in today's Spain I don't think uh, Muslim writers are discussed at all. I was listening to a talk by Tariq Ali, the British writer of Pakistani origin. Tariq Ali said that in Spain the entire Muslim history of 800 years is perhaps taught in one page. In one page, they teach the entire Muslim history of seven, eight hundred years. This is how Muslim history, Muslim heritage, Muslim tradition is being forgotten, is being neglected. Uh, and Tariq Ali did a wonderful job. He wrote um, five books, and he these are called Islam Quintet. And in, in Islam Quintet, Tariq Ali seeks to rediscover, revisit Muslim heritage, Muslim contribution to Spain during those uh, periods, those era. In the previous class, when we were discussing Hassan bin Sabit, there was a question from one of the participants about Orientalism, whether there is any 
orientalist misrepresentation of Hassan Misabit. Personally, I don't worry too much about orientalist caricaturing or orientalist misrepresentation. My worry is about Muslims themselves. If Muslims do not do research on Muslim writers, other people will take advantage and they may misrepresent, they may misinform the re readers. So that's why uh, this, uh, when it comes to Islamic writers, my worry is that Muslim scholars are not engaged in literary discussion. Muslim scholars are not engaged in rediscovering, highlighting their cultural and literary heritage. And there is a slight misrepresentation of uh, Ibn Hazm. As I came across different sources, I found that there are some misinformation and distortion of his life, which is perhaps uh, uh, unstoppable because when other people uh, do research on writers like Ibn Hazm, they will bring in their own views, their own world views. So the uh, defense that we need to have uh, is to do our own research so that uh, writers like Has uh, Ibn Hazm cannot be mi misrepresented by other people. Uh, so he is, his full name is Abu Muhammad Ali Ibn Ahmad Ibn Said Ibn Hazm. He is mainly known as Ibn Hazm and sometimes as Abu Muhammad. And he is m uh, called Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi because of uh, his origin, he is from Muslim Spain. And he is also called Ibn Hazm of Cordoba because he was born in Cordoba. Uh, I was reading a biography of Ibn Hazm and it was written by Adil Salahi. Adil Salahi is a British scholar of Syrian, or Syrian origin. So Adil Salahi, in his biography of Ibn Hazm, mentions an anecdote, a story. And there is a, the, the story actually involves a debate between two scholars. One is uh, Sheikh Al-Bazi Al-Maliki. He is also a, a Spanish Muslim scholar. And the other one is Ibn Hazm. It's a very interesting debate. So Sheikh Al-Bazi, a Maliki scholar, he was saying to Ibn Hazm, and I share this quote uh, in the chat box. He said that I have put more effort in pursuing studies and learning. You have pursued your studies, having all the help you need. You had a gold plated lamp lighting up you study at night while I had to rely on the street lamp for my night reading. So this is what uh, Ibn Hazm's opponent, Sheikh Al-Bazji said to Ibn Hazm that I was brought up in a squalid environment. I was suffering from poverty. I did not have light to read at night. Conversely, you Ibn Hazm, you are brought up in affluence and you came from a very rich family background. So this was uh, Al-Bazi's uh, argument debate uh, to Ibn Hazm. And what Ibn Hazm said in reply is amazing. I mean, this, is, this tells us his argumentative power, how he uh, in, uh, uh, participated in uh, debate, uh, um, in argument and counter argument. Ibn Hazm said in reply, this argument goes against you, not for you. You pursued your studies when you were in such conditions in the hope that your learning will help you to change your circumstances to something like mine. I pursued my studies in the circumstances you have described, aspiring for nothing other than the status knowledge impers in this life and in the life to come. So Ibn Hazm retorts, he replies in such a wonderful manner that you perhaps studied so hard to change your financial 
situation. He wanted to be a rich person like me, perhaps. But my intention for study had no other reason except for elevation uh, in, uh, uh, in life hereafter. So this, is, this tells us about Ibn Hazm's argumentative power, like, and he is known for his incisive and argumentative skills, and that was uh, during his uh, lifetime. Uh, he was incomparable. So when I was reading Ibn Hazm's biography, I find some uh, differences of opinion about his origin. Uh, I was reading uh, James Krizjak's book, uh, Anthology of Islamic Literature. James Krizjak, the American scholar of Islamic literature says that uh, uh, he was born, Ibn Hazm was born in 994 at Cordoba into a family recently converted from Christianity to Islam. So this is what James Krizjak says in his book that Ibn Hazm was born into a family that recently converted from Christianity to Islam. But what I have found in Adil Salahi's biography is different. Adil Salahi says that he was born in Cordoba and he says that he is of the Persian origin and that his great Persian ancestor was an ally of Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, the first Muslim governor of Syria under the second caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab and the elder brother of Muabiyah, who was later to become caliph. Ibn Hazm's family in the Andalus belonged to the ruling class of the Umayyad dynasty. His father was indeed a minister in the Umayyad court. So this is a difference of opinion about the origin of Ibn Hazm's family background. James Krizjak said that he came from a converted family but uh, Adil Salah, he obviously believes that he came from, uh, his origin goes back to Persia, uh, to a, a Muslim origin. Now, Ibn Hazm, as I said earlier, was brought up uh, in affluence as he was born into a very rich family. And he received education from, mainly from two sources. One is, the women in the family. The other one is from prominent scholars. This is something that we need to take note of. Ibn Hazm was taught by women in the family. And these women were maids uh, uh, in the family who, were, who had a certain level of education, uh, maids of certain accomplishment, and another group of teachers that he had was prominent scholars of Cordoba. So he received learning from these two sources, his early, early learning. Uh, but life for Ibn Hazm was not very smooth. He was born in Cordoba at a time when uh, the uh, Muslim rule in Spain was having started to have problems. There were there were factions among Muslims. There were rivalries. There are uh, different groups fighting against each other. That was actually the beginning of the fall of Muslim Spain. We generally uh, date it as 1492 as the year when Muslims finally was exterminated. Uh, Muslims finally were exterminated from Spain, but actually the actual downfall started in uh, year 1000 when there were different factions and infightings among Muslims in Spain. And Ibn Hazm was also a victim of that kind of infighting and factions. And uh, his father was also in trouble because of these uh, uh, political turmoils. His father was arrested and his father died when Ibn Hazm was 18 years old. Now, <clears throat> Ibn Hazm uh, was exposed to different mazhab, different uh, 
uh, schools of Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, Muslim Spain was actually dominated by uh, Maliki school of uh, uh, thought, Maliki school of jurisprudence. Uh, but Ibn Hazm also studied the Shafi Mazhab, then he also studied the Hanafi Mazhab. Finally, he refused to follow any particular Mazhab. And this is what he declared after when he became confident in his uh, understanding of Islam. This is what he said uh, to uh, uh, people in, uh, in Spain. He said that, I follow the truth wherever it leads me, making every effort to do so without conforming to a single school. So that is to say that he did not follow any particular mazhab when it was the norm to follow a mazhab. And he was simply in search of truth and truth led him, guided him. Now, Ibn Hazm had his own personal suffering because of political infighting among Muslims in Muslim Spain. Uh, there was a time when he was in argument with other scholars and as punishment, he was expelled from Cordoba and most of his books were burned in front of him. And that is one reason why we do not have all the writings of Ibn Hazm in record. Because at that time when a book was written, it, it has only maybe one or two or few copies. Uh, publishing houses were not there, printing, was not invented at that time. So it was a time when people used to write and preserve their work, uh, maybe in few copies, maximum. So that was the time when his writings, his books were burned uh, in public and he had to flee Cordoba and he lived in, the vill in a village uh, in his later life. Uh, and then there are some other uh, differences uh, of opinion that Ibn Hazm had from other scholars. Ibn Hazm believes that there are female prophets. This is a, some kind of iconoclastic opinion. Ibn Hazm believes that there are uh, female prophets. And this was his argument. He said that these were the four female prophets mentioned in the Quran. Number one is Maryam. Number two is Sarah, uh, Prophet Ibrahim's wife. Number three is the mother of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And number four is Asiya, wife of Pharaoh. So he believes that these uh, four women were prophets. And that was uh, also a kind of very uh, iconoclastic or uh, a very uh, uh, radical idea, radical view that Ibn Hazm maintained uh, uh, during his lifetime. Uh, and obviously not many people were ready to accept this view. And what was his argument to establish that there are female prophets? Ibn Hazm said that there are two kinds of prophets. One group are the prophets and the messengers. The prophets, they are also messengers. They received uh, revelation from God. They received book and they were uh, uh, commanded by Allah to spread the message. But there are other prophets who were not messengers. And he said that not all prophets were messengers. Well, all messengers were prophets. So Ibn Hazm said that these four women, they were simply prophets. They were not messengers. Uh, I repeat, he said that all prophets, sorry, all messengers are prophets but not all uh, prophets are messengers. In that sense, he said that all these four women, they were actually prophets, not necessarily messengers. That is another a kind of radical uh, argument, idea that Ibn Hazm maintained. Uh, Ibn Hazm also rejected uh, any kind of you know, Qiyas, 
or analogy in Islamic jurisprudence. He was a kind of literalist or Zahiri. He did not entertain any qiyas, any interpretation. He just took uh, the literal sense of, uh, of Quran and Sunnah. So he rejects analogy altogether. Uh, he also rejects personal or public interest, that is Maslaha. Uh, and uh, he, uh, to him, uh, all these kind of arguments, reasonings that people use in Islamic jurisprudence are unacceptable. So that is uh, an idea, uh, his opinion. Obviously, not many people will agree with him. And in today's world, uh, we uh, promote Maslaha. Islam and there are many, uh, not many scholars will follow uh, what Ibn Hazm uh, maintained. Now, <clears throat> Ibn Hazm was a great poet. Uh, obviously, in the past, uh, we uh, people were mainly polymath. Polymath are those who are multifaceted scholars. They were expert in many many disciplines in today's world we are specialists we do not uh, 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 receive uh, expertise in many areas of knowledge we specialize in a particular area but in the past most scholars were polymath they used to uh, visit many, many branches of knowledge. Uh, in that sense, Ibn Hazm was also a polymath, but he was also a poet of great merit. And it is believed that if he did not devote his time to Islamic law and other Islamic discipline, he could be one of the top poets in Arabic, Arabic literature. And I also, I must say this thing that Ibn Hazm wrote in uh, Muslim Spain, but he wrote in Arabic. That was the language of uh, intellectual persuasion up until the 17th century. Up until the 17th century, in Muslim societies around the world, Arabic was the language of intellectual persuasion. Most intellectual books uh, written by Muslim scholars were in Arabic. So even though Ibn Hazm lived in Muslim Spain, he's, he wrote in Arabic. Uh, that was the time when Arabic was the language of intellectual persuasion. And when European colonialism uh, expanded, that was replaced by, Arabic was replaced by European languages. And through his writing, Ibn Hazm used to uh, defend Islam, uh, against attacks by Christians and Jews in his society. And he, as I said earlier, that he had sharp intelligence and he has very clear logic and powerful argumentative power. He had lucid language and that was of great value to Islam. And this was again a great similarity between Ibn Hazm and Hassan bin Sabit. Hassan bin Sabit used his poetic genius to serve Islam and to defend the character of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, Ibn Hazm also used his scholarship and argumentative power to defend Islam against unjust attack by other people. And he was also known for his fine superior literary style. Uh, so we may not have time to discuss his literature in great detail, but it's important to know that Ibn Hazm's writing style was uh, uh, way of above average. Uh, and I came across a PhD thesis, uh, which was completed from the University of Tennessee in 2014. And in that PhD thesis, the writer, the researcher argues that uh, courtly love literature was actually greatly uh, influenced by Ibn Hazm's book, Thawq al Hamam, uh, which we will discuss uh, in uh, this class, inshallah. So, <clears throat> he, as I said, he was a multifaceted scholar, a polymath, so he was 
an expert in political science and he was an expert in comparative religion he was an expert in religious pluralism and obviously he was a great literary writer and he wrote 400 books or 400 works uh, perhaps not all of them were books uh, can you imagine like one writer he wrote 400 works in his lifetime but as I said earlier, many of them were burned during his lifetime because of political rivalry and factionalism. So we have only 40 surviving. And from these 40, I am familiar with two of them. One is Tawq al Hamama, that is the dove's necklace or the ring of the dove that was published in uh, 1022. The other one is Al Akhlaq wal Siyad morals and behaviors. These are the two works that we will discuss to some length today, inshallah. Now, uh, in his al Akhlaq wal Siyad, Morals and Behavior, uh, uh, let me share the title with you. Uh, it is Al Akhlaq wal Siyar, Morals and Behaviors. This is a wonderful book, and I teach uh, sections from this book to my students at International Islam Islamic University in Malaysia. So I will share some uh, excerpts from this book with you so that we can enjoy uh, some uh, beauty of his language. And obviously, we may not. Uh, uh, get the original uh, taste uh, that was in Arabic, we will simply uh, read the English translation and we will uh, become familiar with his uh, writing. So this is al Akhlaq wal Siyad. And he said in the, at the beginning of this book that I have chosen to master these problems by study and contemplation. He is talking about problems of human beings that he discusses in this book. Rather than throw myself into the various sensual pleasures which attract most souls on this earth, rather than MS unnecessary wealth. He said, I did not uh, pursue sexual pleasures or I did not busy myself uh, uh, being rich or getting wealth and property, I rather devoted myself uh, to understand the problems of human beings. And this book, he said, will benefit a person more than financial treasures and possessions of property. He said this book is more valuable than financial treasures and possessions of property. Uh, property. If he meditates upon it and if Allah enables him to make good use of it. As for myself, my hope in this enterprise is to win the greatest reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since my intention is to help his servants, to remedy whatever is corrupt in their character, and to heal the sickness of their souls, I beseech the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Almighty, we wish only for Allah and the best of defenders. So you can see like how scholars of the past like Ibn Hazm was different from many scholars in today's world. He makes it clear at the beginning that whatever he is doing, he is writing this book for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His intention is to win the greatest reward from Allah, not recognition from human being or not praise and appreciation, admiration from other human being. And I belong to the academic world and I know how many people, they get a degree, they learn, they come to university, get a PhD or become a professor only for recognition. Only that other people will call them a doctor or a professor or a great scholar. So the intention of making Allah happy or pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my knowledge, 
through intellectual exercise is absent among many uh, scholars in today's world, Muslims and non-Muslims. It is more disheartening when we see that Muslim scholars are engaged in scholarship not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather for adulation for, for other purposes. Now, I will try to cover the first chapter from this book, Al Akhlaq Wal Siyah. In the first chapter of this book, Ibn Hazm talks about anxiety, how we can remove anxiety from our life. I think all of us, in today's class, all the participants, including myself, all of us have different kinds of anxieties. There is not a single human being who does not have anxiety uh, it, it, to different degrees. So Ibn Hazm has taken up this subject and he wants to address it and advise Muslims and the readers how to dispel anxiety, how to get rid of anxiety. Sometimes we believe that if we become rich, we will be happy. But after we become rich financially, we see there are more anxieties, other anxieties. Sometimes we believe, oh, if I get a good degree, if I uh, get a PhD, I will be very happy. But after receiving a PhD, we encounter different sets of anxieties. So anxieties are everywhere. Now, before I discuss Ibn Hazm's uh, treatment of anxiety, I want to share with you an English poem uh, by George Herbert. And this poem, we can relate this poem to Ibn Hazm's uh, concept of anxiety. George Herbert, he uses his imagination and he says that when God at first made man, that means when God first made human being, having a glass of blessings standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which disperse lie, contract into a span. So what it, uh, George Herbert says is that when God created human being, the human being was there like a vessel and there was a glass next to God. And in that glass, God pours different blessings. And he will put one blessing after another into the uh, human body. So this is how, obviously, this man, this is just uh, uh, George Herbert's imagination. George Herbert is a metaphysical poet, a poet of the 17th century. So, and this is also considered a, a metaphysical poem. Is that God created human being and he was putting different blessings into human being. So strength first made a way. First, God put strength into the human body. Then beauty flowed, flowed. Then God put beauty, then wisdom, then honor, then pleasure. So all these blessings, one after another, entered the human body. All was out. God made a step. When almost all the blessings were into the human body, God halted. God made a step, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest is rest in the bottom leg. So the last blessing that was in the glass next to God was rest. Rest means freedom from anxiety. Freedom from anxiety. So God did not put rest into the human body. What God did he said, no, no, I'm not going to put rest into the human body. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also, you would adore my gifts instead of me. God said, if I give human being rest, freedom from anxiety, human being will forget about me. Human being will not worship me, he will rather worship the gifts that I have given him. And rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. So if I give them rest, freedom from anxiety, human being will not remember me. So I will lose them and they will lose me. In that sense, both should losers be. 
yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and worthy, that at least if goodness lead him not, yet worthiness may toss him to my breast. So God said that if he is not good, if he is not grateful to me, perhaps his restlessness, his anxiety will bring him to me. So this is what George Herbert says in the poem that all human beings have this restlessness, have this anxiety. And Ibn Hazam says the same thing in, this, uh, in his book that all human beings suffer from anxiety. Sometimes in our pursuit to remove anxiety, we add more anxieties. So this is uh, his, uh, uh, the main theme in the first chapter of this book. And he, was, he uh, um, advises the reader how to remove anxiety, how to uh, achieve freedom from anxiety. Now let us read. This is a wonderful essay. Uh, I uh, came across two translations of this uh, chapter. One is by James Krizek, and the other one is the book that I have shared with you through Brother Sharon. Uh, perhaps you have it, so uh, I hope you will uh, read it later uh, when you have time. So let us read. Ibn Hazm says, the pleasure which a prudent man has from his own good sense, a scholar from his knowledge, a wise man from his wisdom, the pleasure of anyone who works hard in ways pleasing to Almighty God is greater than the pleasure which uh, the Gome has from his food. So he discusses two types of pleasure at the beginning of this book. The pleasure that a scholar receives from his knowledge, and the pleasure that a wise man from, receives from his wisdom, and the pleasure that anyone who works hard in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala receives from his work. This kind of pleasure, metaphysical pleasure, pleasure of knowledge, pleasure of wisdom, and the pleasure of working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this kind of pleasure is much greater than the pleasure which the gome has from his food people who are inclined to eating and drinking, this kind of people also get pleasure. But Ibn Hazm says, the pleasure of the wise man, the scholar, and the people who work for Allah is much higher. A lover from the act of love, a conqueror from his conquest, a reveler from his amusements, or a commander from giving orders. So all these are lesser pleasures. Ibn Hazm says all these are lesser pleasure. These are not genuine pleasure. The proof of this is that the wise man, the prudent man, the scholar, the practicing Muslim, and all those who have all that, all, all those that we have mentioned are capable of enjoying this pleasure as much as the man who indulges in them. So they are also capable. They have the same feelings, desires as to who uh, hasn't to satisfy them. But they have deliberately refrained and turned away from them, preferring to seek after moral excellence. So scholars, they also can enjoy food. They also can enjoy other kind of lesser pleasure, but they have chosen a higher pleasure. And he says, none can judge these two kinds of pleasure except someone who has known both not someone who has known only one and not the other. That means people who are involved or indulgent in lesser pleasure, they have no idea about the, about the higher pleasure. The pleasure of knowledge, the pleasure of scholarship and the pleasure of working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the people who have the higher pleasure, they know about the pleasure, about the lesser pleasure. So this is an interesting distinction that he, he makes, that the ignorant people who are indulgent in, uh, in lesser pleasure, they have no idea about the pleasure that we receive from uh, uh, intellectual persuasion, intellectual exercise, or working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ibn Hazm says, if you look deeply into worldly matters, you will become melancholy and will end by reflecting upon the ephemeral nature of everything here below. 
So in this world, here below means in this world, we find almost everything is temporary. Almost everything, our wealth, our beauty, our power, our status, almost everything is temporary. Nothing is permanent. And the fact that truth lies only in striving for the hereafter. But the truth lies only in striving for the hereafter. So that is something permanent. When we work for the hereafter, that is permanent. Since every ambition to which you might cling will end in tears. Either the goal is snatched from you or you have to give the attempt up before you reach it. So when we are after wealth and property, sometimes it, it is stolen from us, snatched away from us, or sometimes we try but we cannot attain it. One of these two ending is inevitable, except in the search for God, the Almighty and the and powerful. But if we are in search of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we are in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is something uh, always with us. Nobody can take this away from us. That is always with us. Then the result is always joy, both immediate and eternal. When we work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the joy is immediate and also eternal. The immediate joy is because you stop worrying about the things which usually worry people. This leads to an increase in the respect paid to you by friends and enemies alike. The eternal joy is the joy of paradise. So when we work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have some kind of respect from people in this world that gives us some amount of joy but the actual joy is the joy of paradise why he is saying this at the beginning because he is giving us a, a hint that this is the only way to remove anxiety from our life that we need to work for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to work for hereafter if we work for this world then we may not attain a freedom from anxiety in this world. I have tried to find one goal which everyone would agree to be excellent and worthy of being striven after. Striven after. I have found only one to be free from anxiety. Now, this is a kind of discovery that Ibn Hazm made uh, 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 during his lifetime that he said that only one thing that all human beings are in agreement is that we want freedom from anxiety on this ground all human beings are united in all other cases there will be disagreement differences between human beings not all human beings want knowledge not all human beings want spouses not all human beings want fame and reputation not all human beings want to be strong and powerful. Not all human beings want to be this and that. But as regards freedom of freedom from anxiety, all human beings are united. When I reflected upon it, I realized that not only do all agree in valuing it and desiring it, but I also perceive that despite their many different passions and aspirations and preoccupations and desires, uh, they never make the slightest gesture unless it is designed to drive anxiety far away. So all our activities are driven to one goal, that is to remove anxiety. Dispelling anxiety is a goal upon which all nations agree from the time when the Almighty created the world until the day when this world will pass away and be followed by the day of judgment. So he says this is universal. That all human beings, all nations are united. That all of us want freedom from anxiety. And their actions are directed to this one goal. In the case of every other objective, there will always be some people who do not desire it. Then he gives different examples. There are some who by nature and inclination prefer obscurity to fame. Not all people want recognition or fame. There are some who have no interest in amassing a fortune. There are people who do not want to be rich, preferring abstinence to ownership. And they want abstinence. Uh, niggardly and they want uh, poverty 
This was the case with many of the prophets. Most of the prophets did not, did not hanker after property. God's peace be upon them. And those who followed their example, ascetics and philosophers. There are some who by nature dislike sensual pleasures and scorn those who seek after them. Some people, they do not want sexual or sensual pleasures. Such those men who have just mentioned and who prefer to lose a fortune rather than gain it. Many people just want to get rid of their fortune, their property. Some prefer ignorance to knowledge. In fact, most of the people that you see in the street are like this. Most people in the streets, in big, big bazaars, most people have nothing to do with scholarship or knowledge. These are the objectives of people who have no other aim in life. Nobody in the whole world from the time of his creation until its end would deliberately choose anxiety and would not desire to drive it far away. So in other words, Ibn Hazm again emphasizes that all human beings want to get rid of anxiety. And now in this uh, essay, his main objective is to tell us what is the way to remove anxiety from our life. So uh, I think we don't have time to read all the excerpts. So I just want to uh, read this one. He said, what he says in, his, uh, in this book is that, the only way to remove anxiety is to do good work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only good work is not enough to remove anxiety. Only good work is not enough. For example, if someone does charitable work, does charity, but for fame or for uh, return, that person may not remove anxiety because when we do charity, we give money to the poor, if we want recognition and if we want some return from those people or if we want them to help us when we are in distress, perhaps they will never be uh, uh, grateful to us. Because in the Quran Allah says, وَقَلِيلٌ min عِبَادِيَ shakur." Very few human beings are grateful. But if we do charity, charitable work, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then whether we receive recognition whether people are grateful to us we will not worry at all so that's why ibn hazam says in this uh, book uh, that the only way to remove anxiety is to do good work there are two conditions one is to do good work the other one is to do good work for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there must be a combination of these two uh, components one is doing good work. Number two, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing wrong deeds for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not what we want. And only doing good work, but not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also not good. So there must be a combination of these two. We must do good work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only then we'll be able to remove anxiety. And Ibn Hazm says uh, uh, in, in, in this book that people who uh, uh, they use all their energy time for other things, uh, for, not for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are like someone who exchanges gemstone for gravel. So they are someone who exchanges pearls for stones. So Ibn Hazm says, for our good work, we can please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if our intention is good. But people who do not make Allah their target, people who do not make the pleasure of Allah their target, they are just simply wasting their energy, time, and effort. And in this regard, one Quranic verse is very relevant. And in the Quran, Allah says, uh, let me try to read this verse. A'udhu billahi shaitan rajim. This is from Surah Al-Kahf, verse 103 and 104. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, O Prophet, uh, 
shall we inform you of the greatest losers in their deeds? Shall we inform you about the losers in their work, in their deeds? These are those who labor, whose labor is misdirected. Their effort is misdirected. And their effort is lost in worldly life, even though they think that they are doing well in work. So we have many experts, many professionals, many people who are excellent in their, in the, in their work. But if they do not make the pleasure of Allah their target, according to the Quran, these are the losers. These are the losers indeed. Uh, and I just want to conclude uh, with one uh, hadith. Uh, you may see in the screen, the hadith is, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, how wonderful is the affair of the, uh, of the believer? How wonderful is the affair of the believer? Ajaban li amril mu'min. For his affairs are all good. And this applies to no one but the believer. If something good happens to him, he is thankful for it and that is good for him. And if something bad happens to him, he bears with it with patience and that is good for him. So what our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says is that a believer who makes the pleasure of Allah his target, the object of his life, a, such a believer will never feel disappointed, will never suffer from anxiety. Because when he achieves something, he will feel grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he fails in something, he will remain patient and that is also good for him because he will be rewarded for his patience. So I have not been able perhaps to do justice to Ibn Hazam's uh, uh, book, uh, this particular uh, uh, section uh, uh, that is anxiety that I wanted to highlight. But I request all participants, brothers and sisters, to read it. What Ibn Hazm uh, says in uh, here is that all human beings suffer from anxieties and anxiety is unavoidable. The only way to remove anxiety, to achieve freedom from anxiety is to do good work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With this, I conclude and we have a few minutes for questions and answers, inshallah. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Um, I think I'm a loss of word to, to see that how beautiful is uh, the wording, uh, the point by Ibn Hazam. We are all uh, worried, we are all uneasy with our life. But what Ibn Hazam says that if we do good works for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the best solution. I hope we have more time to talk with you, to learn all of this interesting paragraph and thing, inshallah. Maybe we will arrange a special session later on. Okay. One uh, question from Ustaz Halima. Uh, what is the point of acknowledge, acknowledging the intention of a Muslim writer on his or her work? Is this uh, any... Uh, sorry, I mean, again? I mean, uh, when, when the writer writes a book, he acknowledges his in, in, intention. Is this an important process? I mean, uh, at the preface of your book, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think any, uh, I don't find anything wrong in it, like to acknowledge. That, that has nothing to do with uh, hankering after recognition and one reputation and uh, people's adulation. This is different. When we acknowledge someone in a book, in a writing, that is a kind of uh, gratefulness to those people who helped us. Uh, I think uh, we should not confuse this with those people who, who are after reputation and recognition. Uh, uh, but uh, this is important to bear in mind that uh, we should not uh, target uh, people's uh, uh, recognition or praise and admiration, the target of our intellectual exercise. Oh, this is the last question by Badr Nurudi, and you also can read it. Uh, it is interesting about Ibn Hazm's explanation in overcoming anxiety by, get, by getting closer to Allah. In other words, the search for ultimate truth will result in true freedom. 
I think Ibn Hazm's conclusion about the universality of this idea is well founded. Christianity, for example, people are familiar with the words of Jesus in the Bible, which states, "And ye shall, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free." Please respond. Uh, you shall know the truth, and truth will make you free. Uh, uh, that is perhaps subject to interpretation. If we know the truth and if we, our intention is to follow the truth, uh, I don't see anything wrong in it. Perhaps this is also the mission of Ibn Hazm. Uh, I think in one of the quotes that I shared with you, he said he is after truth. He is uh, trying to learn the truth. When he achieves the truth, he will follow it. And the, I, I don't find any contradiction between this and what the, the, and the main thesis of uh, his book, uh, the way to remove anxiety. Okay, bro. Uh, you mentioned about this Zahiri approach, that uh, literal. Can you explain a little bit more about this? Like and the Zahiri must have is, is a kind of a school of thought that uh, people who are literalist, they do not uh, entertain uh, interpretation or reasoning or the qiyas analogy in Islamic jurisprudence. They depend on the letter of the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, so he uh, is one of the proponents of Zahiri Mazhab, the Zahiri school of thought. Obviously, I do not belong to this philosophy, to this thought. We, uh, in different Mazhab, we uh, resort to interpretation, analogy, and reasoning. But this was his uh, uh, approach, and we must respect it, uh, respect his intellectual standpoint. Uh, so the Zahiri, in other words, a literal approach. They do not want to entertain any reasoning or interpretation. They just look at the letter of the Quran and Sunnah, and then they make their judgment based on it. Okay, anyone else want to ask? If you have one or two minutes. Okay, well, we have Brother Nurdin again. The last one, probably. Maybe you can read. How do you view Ibn Qayyim poetry? I think it's uh, Ibn Hazm. Yeah, yeah Ibn, uh, you mean Ibn Hazm? Like, uh, how uh, do you view Ibn Qayyim poetry? I think like uh, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Qayyim wrote various poems that contain Islamic messages. Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, I have not read Ibn Qayyim's poetry. So, inshallah, I will uh, make an effort to read them. Okay, okay, Rolf. Uh, I think you have a big task to conclude uh, the whole story of Ibn Hazab, why he's so famous <laughs> in the Muslim world. <laughs> we just talked about his poetry. Oh, how about other, other contribution? And as a final remark. Uh, uh, no, I, I think we don't have much time. I just want to uh, talk about the next class. Oh, okay. uh, I can assure all my brothers and sisters that the next class would be very interesting. We will be discussing uh, Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi oh. and we will see how Rumi has been distorted, misrepresented uh, by Western scholars. So please, you uh, invite your friends and acquaintances to join. I can assure you that in the, ne the next class will be very interesting. I believe most of you, all of us will enjoy, inshallah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, I feel very uh, enlightened, enlightened by this uh, quotation from this Azam, of course, uh, Hassan bin Sabir has uh, and we look forward for uh, next week. We'll see everyone next day and uh, next time, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.